Hey, welcome back to the Extraordinary Podcast. I uh, wanted to take a second to talk about my guest today. He's an incredibly special man. And uh, I struggled this week trying to put into words a proper introduction. Um, he's got all these patents and a slew of devices that he's invented, all these awards. You'd think that my typical high praise introduction would be pretty easy. And I don't know, maybe it was because we had a house full of kids and the schedule's been all turned upside down this week, but I don't know, it's just different. This man is by far the smartest person I've ever sat across from, and yet his humble presence and his soft-spoken tone were mesmerizing at times. I often struggled to stay focused and on track with the interview. It went a lot different than I expected it to. And the, uh, the spirit that emerges throughout the course of the interview, it really got to me, particularly at the end. And I certainly wasn't expecting that. Uh, so I don't wrap up much, simply because I couldn't speak at that point. But it definitely gave me pause. I guess when you're dealing with life and death on a daily basis, especially with the innocence of childhood, it puts a lot of things into perspective. Facing terribly difficult situations and circumstances where the odds are typically stacked against you. It requires not just a physician, but someone with a more spiritual perspective. I continued to get emotional as I attempted to edit this episode, so I decided to pretty much just leave it as it is. This interview was an incredible experience for me that I will never forget, and I hope after listening you feel the same. Enjoy. Most of us remember the pager, back in the day before cell phones, but most of us fail to fully recognize or appreciate what that pager represented. For doctors like Kim Manwaring, it meant being able to be counted on, to be dependent upon, to be there when someone really needs your particular expertise. That level of purpose is what pushes Dr. Manwaring to reach beyond the ordinary. He is forever pushing the frontiers of scientific discovery, technical skill, and human understanding. Now, Dr. Manwaring spends a large portion of his time on his intense translational research hobby, continuing to develop new devices and inventions. His instruments and sensors are now commonplace in many operating rooms around the world. And for decades, Dr. Manwaring has been doing state-of-the-art clinical work in his pediatric neurosurgery practice. You might assume that someone with such tremendous talent and skill would have an inflated ego or carry an air of bravado. But far from it, this soft-spoken genius oozes humility and acts like a child at heart. His love of learning and discovery keeps him pushing the boundaries of what is scientifically, technologically, and even humanly possible, forever looking to the next frontier. Get ready for an intense, an introspective conversation with Dr. Kim Manware. So how long are you in town for? Uh, so I come in for 10 days at a time. 10 days. Yeah, so Thursday I'll fly out. And the way things are going, we'll see how that goes because many of the hospitals in the nation are scrambling to control the, yeah. the doctor's travel right now for anticipating what might be the case. Well, there was a big conference that was scheduled for the, at the uh, Marriott Convention Center where, I, where we had our conference, and it was scheduled to start, I think, tomorrow the next day, and they canceled it. Yeah. It was all be- medical-based conferences. Yeah, this is all new territory for us. So, yeah, so being that you, not, I mean, your brain surgery, so you're not necessarily an expert in the field of... of uh, epidemiology and but uh, tell me about what your take is on all this corona virus I've been impressed at the impact upon our economy and the scrambling that is the alarm level when on the other hand physicians and families are very familiar with inhaled respiratory acquired viral illnesses and the uh, death rate across the world is in flux, but it runs from the same levels of flu up to about two times as high, mostly affecting the elderly. So in the sense that people who are exposed to the infection, the majority of them will um, do fine and then they will become immune, meaning they will have been exposed. Um, It's hard to 
really understand if this is an overreaction or an appropriately positioned reaction. On the other hand, uh, in my life, I'm not familiar with a epidemiologic event that has so organized and orchestrated the whole world. So, Yeah, so there's probably some pros and cons that are kind of coming as, right. a, as a result of all of this. That's right. That's interesting. That's great to get your perspective on that. I appreciate that. We'll roll right in. Okay. This is the Extraordinary Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Kim Manmoring. That's me. Thank you for taking the time. You are, you have to be one of the busiest guys that I know, and you're one of the most fascinating guests I've been able to have on the show, so I really appreciate um, you taking the time, and I'm, and I'm grateful that the stars aligned, that I was able to get you in town. We were just talking, you know, you're bouncing between Phoenix and Utah and down here in Orlando, and uh, why don't you tell, for those who don't know, um, tell us a little bit about what it is that you do. Well, my career is defined by pediatric neurosurgery, uh, but I am now a part-time clinician and three-quarters time researcher. So I work seven to ten days a month in the clinical arena of doing surgeries, and the remainder of the time I have my intense translational research hobby, which means that I like to work on the bench developing new devices which can in time make a difference in people's lives. Uh, so I thrive on that hobby and uh, I travel a great deal trying to gain the opinions and guidance and trials of patients around the country and even the world. That's great. And I love how you describe it as a hobby yeah. because so many of us are, <laughs> we call it a job and we're still struggling with it. Um, but in your hobby, you've created some amazing devices, patents. My dad was saying you're somewhere 12 to 20 different patents and inventions all in within the uh, pediatric neurosurgery field. Well, currently I have 40 patents. 40. <laughs> and a couple of them are pending. And I have developed five products which are commercialized and sold throughout the world. And I have two of them imminently to become so and many on the bench. <laughs> nice. Yeah, always a bunch in the works, right? That's correct. That's, that's fun. Um, so let me ask you, how did all that start? How did? But I'm really interested from the invention and the tinkering side. Was that something that was always kind of with you as a kid? Is that something that you identified with early? Or? Well, perhaps so. Uh, I had a brother who was an engineer, professor of engineering, four years older, and he, um, I would say, condescended to allow me to go with him when I was eight years old to ham radio class. And uh, he followed that pursuit, becoming an electrical and computer engineer, but I absorbed the fun of it, and honestly, ham radio has become my uh, Are you interest. a ham guy, too? Yes. Nice. On, on the side. Nice, I, yeah. I, it's magical in many ways. It's amazing what that, we'll, we'll call it an older technology, how that older technology is coming full circle with the cellular service and the things that you can do with it now. It's really, really neat. Uh, this is really true. It's uh, uh, the frontier edge of these technologies, and many of the tinkerers in this area have done something locally or across the world through the airwaves before it has come into the commercialized space. Yeah, yeah, it's funny how it, because radio kind of had its heyday, you know, back when it, you know, in the early, early days, and then you saw, obviously, with the evolution of television, and radio never went away, but it was certainly kind of on the back burner. And now with all the cellular technology, it's like it's coming full circle around and there's these, all these new applications right. for that existing technology that's so neat. So do you tinker with that kind of stuff too? Is that another? Oh, I mean, yes, obviously it's a uh, hobby, but are you like looking at inventions and things with that as well? Uh, yes. If you uh, saw my garage lab, you would see I experiment a great deal with um, radio frequency and driving plasma tubes at frequencies which are known to interrupt or inhibit cell division, which is the underlying challenge in cancer. So I, I like to take a technology and cross-adapt it across 
different areas to see what the yield might be. Well, that's a great segue into one of the inventions that I did want to talk about is um, your chair that you okay. have in, the, in your, I'm going to call it a laboratory. You call it a garage. I don't even think that's really fair to say because it is way more laboratory than it is garage. But could you tell us a little about that chair and like what that does and how that was, again, a kind of a cross of technology into a different field there? Uh, you're referring to a device which looks like a chair, which is intended to address the problem of addiction. This is uh, some distance away from neurosurgery, but patients who have pain, and it's common in adult neurosurgery, especially pain that comes from injuries, particularly back pain and the like, that a person exposed to opioids may develop a dependence to them. And as we talk about in the nation, it's a risk factor of exposure. If you happen to be one of about 10% of the population who it gets exposed the first time and starts to seek that drug effect, this is where we are trying to find alternatives that prevent or to undo the harmful pathway. So most everything I've done in the inventing world has been in collaboration with someone who had another skill and we could complement each other. And I have a couple of colleagues who are um, long-term, what we call R01 grant recipients through the National Institute of Health who specialize in addiction research. And one of them came up with this unique observation starting in animals which found that a specific frequency of stimulation of mechanoreceptors can shut down the perception or feeling of drug craving. This is Scott Stephenson. He okay. is a the grant research recipient. professor at Brigham Young University in neuroscience. Um, his his uh, investigations have ranged from uh, ecstasy to cocaine to alcohol. No all, all of these drugs have a common substrate in the brain which is altered by exposure, making the animal look and act like a human acts, but we are also targeting the associated craving behavior that can be interrupted by his key observation, which is there's a band of frequencies that relieve that craving. So um, I went out to the tractor supply store and bought a tractor seat, uh, divided it into half, and under each half of that seat is what we call a low-frequency effector, which vibrates half of the body in this key range, and it creates in the body what are called interferential beat frequencies. And these beat frequencies you would perceive as a traveling wave up and down from your seat up into your head. And uh, people who typically seat, sit on it immediately feel it's very relaxing, but in the arena of addiction, the goal is to buy time. So uh, if you think of a rehab medicine. hospital, a person has been isolated away from their triggers and access to drugs. In this environment, the real benefit is get them through the space where they are in withdrawal and that the brain can window. gradually begin to reset. Well, this device is intended to be clinic-based, hospital-based, but most important, home-based, so a person can resort to it when they feel that anxiety and craving. And the animal study is very encouraging that in this regard. We hope to show that it works in humans, too. Nice. So will that go through, are you guys in uh, clinical testing with humans at this point, or where are you at with that process? That, that's correct. We're yeah. into trials in humans. That's amazing. That is so cool. Well, that's a great segue into one of the things that um, you talked about, your relationship with this uh, professor at BYU. Uh, you have a very strong relationship with that university, and you do, not only are you doing all your research and your clinical stuff with the hospitals, but you're also heavily involved with BYU with some of your research as well, correct? Uh, yes, I've also done a good deal of uh, uh, research development, animal uh, testing and so forth at the medical school in Salt Lake, the University of Utah. Oh, at University of Utah. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. So, so you have relationships with both. That's correct. Nice. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm sure they don't play like that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Red or blue? You're going to have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, um, your, your kids have also kind of followed in your footsteps down this path. 
Was that something that you like intended? Was that something that that just kind of they just were? Um, uh, all three of my children are in neuroscience related fields. Growing up in our home, one of the key exposure opportunities that gave me great satisfaction was to take them individually on rounds with me on Sundays. This gave me a good chance to get to visit with them, catch up with them, but also expose them to my workplace. And then I took a year of research sabbatical and this provided the opportunity to start bringing the kids into the laboratory on various research projects. So all three of my children have worked on one project or another and two of them actually are uh, collaborating with me in um, product development in two new products. And what products are those? Well, um, one of them actually turned into his dissertation at Dartmouth in his PhD program in engineering. It's a new method of mapping in real time the distribution and pulse of blood in the brain and the swelling of the brain, which I believe has the potential to alter and improve the outcome for severe head trauma as well as stroke. This is an active area of development. and. The second one, it's, it's a cranial implant, uh, which will enable the use, both diagnostically and therapeutically, of ultrasound in the brain. Many people are familiar, of course, with ultrasound in the other parts of the body, but the cranium blocks ultrasound. So uh, hmm. I developed a polymer, which is implantable in the cranium, and when we do a surgery on the cranium, let's say remove a brain tumor, in many instances, it's desirable to replace that window of bone that was removed with this polymer. And then, since we're in this era of handheld, remote, portable, deployable ultrasound, we can on the spot survey how the brain is doing from an anatomic perspective. While you're in there and you have access to it when the cranium is correct. exposed. Wow, that is amazing. But even more exciting than that, we're in this era of the discovery of therapeutics of ultrasound. So ultrasound can uh, destroy tumor, it can heat tumor, it can open up what we call the blood-brain barrier to deliver chemotherapy, uh, it can neuromodulate. For example, one of the prevalent diseases upon us in the United States is depression. About 15% of the population have depression and some of them have refractory depression, meaning it's not responded well to medications and other efforts. And one of the ways that is promising is this approach to neuromodulation. Home-based stimulation to the brain may have potential in stabilizing that condition which comes and goes or ebbs and flows Huh. And uh, this is part of the arena of my daughter. She specializes in adolescent eating disorders. Yeah, she's a clinical psychologist, right? That's right. So whenever I am visiting with my wife to see our children, we have an easy topic to pick up. <laughs> right, right. Plenty of uh, fodder for conversation, for sure. That's really, really cool. Mm. On that topic, and again, I mean, I'm... I understand this on such a rudimentary level. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated with the, I, the with the concept of brain plasticity, yes. and, and and how the the understanding of neuroscience in particular has changed over the last 20 years. Could you speak to a little bit about that, or how that's evolved over the last 20 years? Because obviously you've been in this field for that that and then some. So the brain is unique as an organ in the sense that it cannot repair and replace itself when a portion of it has been lost or injured or has to be resected. Uh, there are promising approaches which may improve that, but in general, the brain recovers by what we call neuroplasticity, which is the development and the compensation of other pathways like um, a rewiring, so to speak. Right. We, we often think of the role of post-surgery or post-injury of rehabilitation. And much of that has accelerated recently due to the advent of immersion in three-dimensional space and the ability to work remotely 
at home with therapists who are guiding us through daily exercises and the like. We've learned a great deal about neuroplasticity due to our ability now to image the brain and see how uniquely each individual is wired. Uh, a great example of that is what we call functional MRI scan, where you can see how the brain distributes and turns on blood flow selectively to the areas that have to be engaged. A, an example might be a, a person who plays the violin. A violin is a very difficult instrument to master, and the areas of the brain which turn on and facilitate the dexterity of the left hand and of course the right hand, but particularly that hard won skill makes a unique pattern that says that person is really skilled with their left hand. And uh, through years of dedicated practice, the brain becomes more and more enabled. The area that's necessary to recruit becomes smaller and focused. So this has given us good insight on many of the strategies that are used now in recovery of the brain. And so how are you implementing those strategies with brain injuries and tumors and things like that? In the uniqueness of uh, childhood, we have another asset, and that is that the child's brain can recover more capably, more completely in many instances than the adult brain. On the other hand, there's a disadvantage with the child, and that is that if the injury occurs before they have developed basic skills we call them the gross and fine motor skills and speech skills, then it's much more challenging. But the young brain has resilience that we don't see in the adult. And uh, won't surprise you, it also involves the importance of uh, socialization and interaction and goals achieving. Uh, all of those things make the brain more capable of working toward recovering a target. Yeah, and in that regard, it is kind of like a lot of the other muscles and things of that nature where like when you work it, when you exercise it, when you challenge it, it tends to respond more. That's correct. Yes, exactly. That's the benefit of the young child's brain and a slow-growing process. When it's in an older person, uh, the approach is that of avoidance. So if surgery involves working in one of the eloquent areas, eloquent meaning where we move our body or we speak or we see, then we use intraoperative methods of mapping and try to correlate it to the imaging beforehand. Even awake surgery is undertaken so that dissection is discerned immediately whether it's causing a new deficit. All of that helps us try to be more aggressive, uh, but it won't surprise you in neurosurgery we're up against some really tough frontiers yeah. where progress moves slowly. Well, and it, yeah, and it's such a tricky, delicate thing. I mean, like I think about the heart surgeries. My daughter had that heart surgery several years ago and how delicate and tricky and intricate that is. And I mean, to do it on the brain level, I mean, it's... It's almost yeah. cellular at that point. Yeah, medicine's full of wonderful challenges with big rewards, but yeah. a lot of frustration. Yeah, some amazing rewards. I mean, some of the payoffs yeah. are, are pretty remarkable. It, it blows my mind. Like, I, I, again, I got a small exposure to that with Charlotte going through her heart surgery. And just to see the, the technology that's involved and the, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating what can be done now in the medical field. It's really exciting. So... What do you think that has been the biggest change over the last 20 years in, in the neuroscience field in particular? Probably the biggest impact has been the capability of non-invasive imaging of the brain. If we think back on my career, so when I started medical school was 1975. Uh, CT scan was 1973 to 74. And actually, uh, most people don't know this, but it was a contribution of EMI, which was a company that got its fame, growth, and development because of the Beatles. I say EMI, isn't that like a re record company? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, in about 1985, we got MRI scanning. And there have been other advances in imaging, but these two have been the mainstay that allow us to correlate uh, an emerging deficit or a new symptom 
with a localizable finding and to precisely plan surgery and then to survey and observe patients. Uh, th those, um, I, I have a favorite quote I memorized when I was in medical school. It was the preface to a anatomy book. And it, it was along the lines, the understanding of any process begins with the precision with which it can be measured. And certainly in neurosurgery, we have seen this. If you take the 1975 CT scan, which had 512 by 512 pixels, and <laughs> look at that grainy image <laughs> and compare it to, to today, it's startling. It's amazing, we now are right? truly submillimetry in measuring change. It's amazing, that's something else. So <clears throat> obviously you're getting an incredible amount of information uh, through medical journals and all the scientific research that you're doing. How else do you go about getting information? How do you consume content? Well, I guess that's a, a, an appropriate parallel to raise because the stunning rate at which you can find answers enabled by the internet. Uh, historically, we waited for summaries in journals to come out and we would leaf through them. These days, we encounter a patient and we can talk to our smartphone and describe a set of symptoms and get a prompting of various possible considerations tests we might investigate. It's truly altered the diagnostic landscape for physicians. And therapeutics come slower, but nevertheless, the ability to rapidly explore and share. Uh, that video access to information. That's right. We exist in our medical levels at really three levels. We have our regular communications which come out in the summaries and in journals. And then we have our little work groups where those of us that have special interest in specific diseases have found each other. And we have our national and international meetings where we come and like to uh, be excited and sharing, look what I achieved. Almost like a little Facebook group for it, doctors it that are experts in their field. It that's is. hilarious. Oh, that's so amazing. On that note, are there any special apps or programs that have helped streamline that process so that access to information? Oh, sure. Um, this has also been garnered the support of industry. Uh, people often don't recognize that the United States produces about three quarters of the world's biotechnology, biopharmacology, and devices. And we can do this because we have a capitalistic medical system that uh, allows us to take risk and push frontiers. At the same time, we have the stabilizing effect of known drugs that are what often works. 10, 15 years old and the like. Yeah. It is because we can take that edge, and more recently in neurosurgery, we really applaud new laws like the right to try uh, because it can be pain, painfully slow to get at new results, even though the ideas are out there. Mm -hmm. Well, and going through that FDA process, one of the things I was out in Utah working with um, a compression recovery system, Rapid Reboot, <clears throat> and they were talking about the process to, of going through FDA because they are technically a medical device. And the thoroughness and everything that you have to go through through that process is very intense and it's very expensive and it's very yeah. time consuming. Um, and rightfully yeah. so. Right. Yeah, my, my experience with the FDA is actually very positive. Most people see them as uh, <coughs> slowing down the progress, but the FDA wants to know that you're doing real science, and they want to know that your data has been methodically organized to present a hypothesis and a path to test it. And when I have conversed with people at the FDA about a new invention, I have been very impressed how diligently they have done their homework to ask well thought out questions. Nice. So to me, uh, the United States is really blessed to have with such an question. organization. And, and it's saved a lot of lives in the process, right? Like, yes. I mean, when you're not studying medical research and, and 
or spending time in that field, what do you enjoy reading? What do you enjoy? Uh, do you do? Are you an audiobooks guy? Are you a podcaster? Well, podcasting is really a, a very intriguing to me. Uh, it's a new phenomenon that's come upon us all, but a lot of us commute to work, and a lot of us unwind by going on long walks. And there's no better thing for me than my bone conducting earphones. That means that I can hear while I'm out there walking. You can hear what's going on around you, but still have that you know, little right. voice in your ear trip. And away. I can stop and start and interact. And so it is also in the car. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful age for us. Yeah, it is. I'm curious, what, what's your, one of your um, favorite books? Well, fiction, nonfiction, um, doesn't matter. Yeah, um, some in my generation may know the book called uh, The Magnificent Obsession. Okay. It's a largely undiscovered book in the next generation. I'm not familiar with it. But I've given copies of that book to many young physicians. Uh, the Magnificent Obsession is a book that was written in 1929 and by the mid-1950s was the most successful self-help book in the United States. Uh, written by a man named Lloyd Douglas. Lloyd Douglas? And he wrote many other well-known books. But The Magnificent Obsession had a huge impact on me. Um, it is the account of a neurosurgeon <laughs> who invents of a course. instrument which can dissect in the brain and seal bleeding vessels as it dissects. And the obsession relates to uh, this neurosurgeon's discovery of how to find answers to otherwise insolvable problems in his pursuit. Uh, so um, not to spoil the storyline, but he learns that doing things for others in secret with no intent to draw on any recognition for it, opens up his mind to what he calls, it's like wires going to heaven that get insulation put on them. And the higher power gets discovered by your doing this for others, and then you get illuminated. And he illustrates this in the book by several stories where he gives money to this now struggling widow or that medical student who has to quit because he can't, uh, can't afford it. And he says, um, I want to help you out, but you have to promise me you will never ever disclose how you got this help. It's between you and me. And by this means, I wish to do good in my life, but also it gives me answers. How in the world have I not heard of that before? That yeah. is amazing. Oh, that's going on the list for sure. That's, that's remarkable. I love that. That's right in my wheelhouse. Oh, that is great. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what your response is to this question. One of the things that I've experienced over my life are, are a lot of failures. Mm -hmm. And I like to call them my favorite failures. I've had some failures that have always ended up being some funny stories and some ironic moments in my life. And, and some failures that, I mean, quite frankly, that I've learned a lot from that have taught me some very valuable lessons in my life. So I would love to know, being that you're an experimenter and an inventor, what's one of your favorite failures? Uh, well, f the field of neurosurgery is full of challenges and I could go on with many sad experiences where uh, I had worked with a patient for a long period of time only to finally not be successful. But it's also... Um, yeah, those aren't exactly favorites. Those are tough to deal with, right? Yeah, those but there are, are also key issues that teach technical challenge. And I have one that may sound a little silly in the ending, but it had a big impact on me. I remember I was in clinic one day and got paged emergently to the operating room to join a general surgeon who was operating on a 
nine-year-old, that child had a large tumor in his abdomen in front of his spine. And while he was removing it, he quickly realized the tumor had invaded or was on the margin of what's called the lumbosacral plexus. Uh, these are the nerves that go to your legs and to the bladder and bowel. And so I was paged to please come join uh, him at surgery. Um, I had never met the child, but in surgery, I was able to uh, use one of the instruments that I invented, and I dissected this into tumor entirely in what we call the extracapsular plane. And the general surgeon looked at me and said, I can't believe you're being so aggressive, and I can't believe you were so aggressive getting this out. Uh, I was pleased, of course, with how it came out. And after surgery, I went to the recovery room to see this child and see how the child was waking up from surgery and went in to test him and I immediately saw that he no longer had anal sphincter tone. That's a huge loss, a huge deficit, lifelong. Yeah. So I walked back quite dejected into the operating room and uh, told the surgeon, well, maybe I was too aggressive. And uh, the anesthesiologist who was back in the room at this point said, well, wait a minute, you didn't get to meet the child before surgery. You don't realize that I had put an epidural catheter in to deliver medication in case that that would be sufficient. And that medication is going to wear off in a few hours and I bet the sphincter function recovers. And sure enough, the uh -huh. sphincter function fully recovered. And every time I followed that kid for the, about the next 10 years, I remembered that experience. The lesson that I've seen many times in neurosurgery in the course of many surgeons' lives is that uh, when you offer a surgery to a patient, you can't be too conservative because you won't benefit them. You can't be too aggressive because you'll hurt them. Right. It's like walking down the top of a fence, heel to toe. But if you aren't willing to be aggressive toward the right side, you won't advance your field. And you will have complications and regrettable events as you've tried. But if you are methodical, thoughtful, honest with families and explain the risks, you honestly get big rewards. Can't be too conservative, can't be too aggressive, but you have to know that line. And that edge, that little story reminds me of that. I was very aggressive taking it out, but I was also lucky. And it taught me an important lesson to be honest, forthright with families before surgery. What are these risks? Yeah. Make sure they really understand everything they're getting into. That's that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That was really cool. Um, so that was a that was a, a failure that ended up working out pretty well. But um, how about an aha moment or or a big win? One of my interests in neurosurgery is what we, what we call minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. In the uh, world of the belly. A lot of people have benefited from endoscopic or laparoscopic gallbladder surgery and so forth. And now in the era of robotic surgery with little small incisions. Amazing. In 20 years ago, I was one of the early workers in this field to develop methods to operate in the brain through a incision that's about a half an inch long and a burr hole in the cranium about the diameter of a pencil. And I went around the world teaching neurosurgeons how to do this. And uh, I remember very well back in early start of my practice, my second year in practice, going to my national meeting, flying home from Baltimore and figuring out on the plane how to do this with a device that had been developed for deep vascular access. Now, translating that further forward, I um, remember uh, I had a, a boy come to me, an adolescent whose father was an emergency room physician. He had, uh, this boy had a tumor in the center of his brain in an area called the thalamus, and it had been largely considered inoperable. The father brought him to me because he had heard I was doing this kind of minimally invasive surgery. 
and he asked, uh, would I consider operating on this? That boy uh, was very, very smart, very gifted pianist, and I contemplated and used a technique called PET scan, positron emission tomography, to map out the best way a corridor between his speech center and his right hand movement center that would allow me to go 12 centimeters deep through a quiet area of the brain to take it out. And uh, I remember after surgery that night coming out of the hospital and looking up at the beautiful blue moon. Uh, I still got a little emotional. Um, and saying, uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, that I got to be the one who could do this for this boy. Um, that boy um, went on to become the valedictorian of his medical school class and went on to become a researcher in uh, brain oncology. That <laughs> way. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Mm. What do you think the next 10 to 20 years looks like in this field? There's been so many advancements and so many different things in this, in neuroscience in general. I feel like that's one area of the science that's really grown a lot over the last 10 to 20 years. What do you think the next 10 to 20 years looks like? Well, across the field of medicine, we all look longingly and hopefully toward the impact of cellular genetic level surgery, excision of abnormal deficient gene instructions and the ability to repair them. In the instance of the brain where I mentioned that large areas could be resected and many tumors perhaps cured, if we could only be so aggressive, it would be nice to have the ability to fall back on cells that can be turned on, resurrected, um, recovered. Right. And this is happening in some areas. Um, ophthalmology, the immune system, uh, some of these areas are the forerunners where we hope that it will translate into neurosurgery. That's fascinating. That's, yeah, that's kind of a, mm, very cool, very neat. When you do get to have some downtime every once in a blue moon, how do you enjoy spending your free time when you're not either tinkering or making rounds? Well, uh, at this phase in my life, uh, it won't surprise you that my wife and I turn often toward the next generation, uh, watching our children with their 12 grandchildren. <laughs> yes, and the that's fun enough of, to um, keep you busy for sure. That's right. I, I believe that on my own life, I think back on who made a difference when, and one only hopes to also enable others. So I enjoy those relationships, not only with my family, but with friends and watching in the pediatric world, I get to see some of my patients grow up to become parents. Yeah. Well, and I imagine you're a mentor for quite a, a long list of individuals on a pretty consistent and regular basis. A couple of things I want to talk to you about, routines and habits and that sort of thing. Um, so what do you think that's something odd, weird, or different about you that has contributed mm. to some of your success? Uh, I want to emphasize the value of a pager. So A pager. Th that's correct. Most people don't even know what that is nowadays. <laughs> I remember when I was in medical school, when I heard my name paged over the university hospital system speaker in Seattle um, to call me to the operating room. And it was uh, both astounding and scary. But by pager, yeah, doctors from the 60s on forward to the era of cell phones carried these small beepers as they're known which would summon them for emergencies to the emergency room or to a patient or to a nurse and the like. Many of us don't have the self-initiative to get up and go discover on our own. 
but we really benefit from colleagues who pull us along, who are good companions in the discovery process, or being dependable or reliable. And in, in medicine, uh, finding a good doctor really comes down to a couple of traits. Uh, number one, are they compulsive? Do they follow through? Do they show up? Are they reliable? And number two, are they compassionate? Um, do they really care for you? In the instance of a pager, I, I remember, um, so pediatric neurosurgery is a little bit of a rarefied field. There are only 200 of us in the whole United States. There are sure. many places it's where, um, yeah, many cities, up to 500,000 and the like, that may have only one pediatric neurosurgeon working cross coverage with adult neurosurgeons. And it can be lonely business and after hours very inconvenient. Uh, it is that pager that can pull you through because people are depending on you. They expect and want you to be there in the emergency room. And I think back on that walk I had with my wife first year into practice. Every night coming home, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 9 o'clock, commonly was working 70 to 80 hours a week, and I knew it was hard on her because we had a young family. And I said, I know this is not easy. I know I am dependent upon. I have to respond and go. And she made it work. It was a sacrifice for her. But for me, um, I look back on this and say, this is an asset. If people are depending upon you, you will do more with your life yeah. than if you have to depend on your own self-initiative to get up and go. Well, it's that, it's that same concept. You'll appreciate this, appreciate this as a doctor. We're, I heard that we're way more likely to give our pets the medication that they're prescribed than we are to take our own medicine that we're prescribed for ourselves. And again, like when you have that higher purpose, when you have that, I like to equate it with being a parent. You know, when you've got that little mouth to feed, yeah. it's amazing the links you'll go to to make sure that they have what they need. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. I love that. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So how about routines? Do you have any morning or evening routines that contribute mm. to some of your success? Do you have any habits that you well, try to? I suppose the most peculiar one, uh, I love to pogo stick. <laughs> well, we were going to talk about that, yeah. but I'm glad that you went ahead yeah. and dove down that path. Yeah, let's talk about that. How do you enjoy getting your exercise? Yeah. About 10 years ago, I had uh, what's called an executive physical this is a physical exam where uh, more than the normal is done. Uh, you get more extensive laboratory tests and imaging and so forth. And Being I was a neurosurgeon, that would make sense, I suppose. Yeah. I'll make uh, sure you're in tip-top shape. <laughs> and I was surprised to learn that I was right on the edge of osteoporosis. So really? osteoporosis is a uh, low density of bone. bone. Yeah. And it's not common in men. It's quite common in women. women. Right. Yeah, right. And uh, so I got very motivated to start to understand what should I do differently. Um, people think of routine things like taking calcium mm -hmm. supplements and the like. But I uh, read that slow, methodical loading were exercises that could do good to make bone grow more density. And explain what you mean by loading for those who don't know. Uh, loading is to put gravitational g-forces on your skeleton. And in that process, it causes the bone forming cells called osteoblasts to lay down new bone. So some exercises are kind of useless. Uh, a nice walk doesn't do much good. Uh, heavy weight lifting is very good, but certainly not in my personality. <laughs> so I in invented a, uh, a heavy weighted uh, jump rope, and I really enjoyed that only to injure both of my knees. I ended up getting bilateral meniscectomy, which is a surgery where the edge of the meniscus is trimmed. As a result of the jump rope? Yeah. No kidding. I pushed it too hard. So <laughs> at this time, I... Uh, started thinking about uh, jumping and I found on the internet a man in California, a retired aerospace engineer, who had developed a new pogo stick which is an air piston. 
uh, you can fill up the tube with the amount of air according to your ambition or your goal level. And your weight and everything That's else, right. right? Yeah. And I started uh, measuring myself. So I had my bone density test and I started jumping. These pogo sticks aren't the typical pogo stick you think of that a child plays with. Uh, These are in my wheelhouse coming from the extreme sports arena. These that, are the extreme right. pogo sticks. That's right. Doing yeah. backflips and the like. <laughs> Now, I don't imagine you're doing the backflips, though, right? Or are you? No. <laughs> are you no, working I, on that? <laughs> my goal is, is to achieve about 4G. Um, that's a, a jump of about three to four feet of the air coming down. Okay. And I do that six times a day. And I jump, uh, so 100 times, six times a day works in my schedule. It takes me about five minutes, six times five, thir <laughs> 30 minutes a day. I can park that pogo stick outside the hospital or outside my car, outside my doorstep, and I have pogo sticks wherever I live. That's amazing. And, and, um, again, it's an interesting example because interruption to your day by high intense exercise, you might call it interval training, yeah, is yeah. a great way to reset your day. And it's fun. It's that uh, feeling that you're flying in the air. Yeah. But it's also immediate feedback because you can say to yourself, I've done this makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah, that, 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 that reinforcing habit kind of thing. That's a, and I can only imagine the, the people in the wing of the hospital out there looking at the parking lot, seeing their neurosurgeon on the, yeah. on the, the sidewalk on a giant pogo stick. That is just amazing. <laughs> Through this engineer, I met um, uh, the group across the nation of elite athletes. Some of these guys are truly amazing. They do flips in the air, yeah, jump they're, over they're cars. They're extreme athletes. And now you're on their board of directors, correct? And, you're, yeah. and well, you I, endorse them. I, I, I used to met an advisor, but otherwise I keep at my distance. Yeah. I, I laughed on the webpage. I was re referred to as the grandpa on the Pogo Palooza. <laughs> <laughs> and talked to several of these. Uh, That's elite. great. But now I've uh, developed this into a, a little attachment on my belt, which will calculate how many jumps I've met, made, but also how high. And now I'm Ooh, trying nice. to organize groups so people can follow themselves. Like a pogo a stick sport. Fitbit kind That's of thing, right? right? That's yeah. amazing. That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Let me ask you this. Any evening routines that you work on or try to do for decompressing, getting ready for bed? Do you struggle with sleeping, that kind of stuff? Well, I, I do. Um, I, I'm a night owl. Are you, that was one my next question, early bird or night owl. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's very, very important that people see what they might consider as deficiencies and turn them into assets. Uh, in my instance, I am very much a night person. And I quickly realized that I would go to bed at 1 a.m. and wake up at 8 a.m. That's how I function best. And you're, you're good with that. That works. Yeah. Well, at medical school and surgery, general surgery training are not at all oriented like that. <laughs> no. You're expected to have rounds done at 6 in the morning and be ready for the first surgery at 7.30. And this was very, very hard on me. Uh, and, but then after training, residency, I realized what it was an asset to be a night owl because most of the calls in pediatric neurosurgery are in the evening. Parents come home and find their child sick right, or the after accidents work. that come in more commonly come in an emergency room. Um, really, you can go four or five hours in the morning and not have a single call to the emergency room and you can get five calls at night between eight and midnight. So I learned that this is perfect for me. I'm glad to go down and do surgery at 10 o'clock and stay there till two and three in the morning because I wake right up. Um, but don't ask me to be there at 7.30 in the morning. Yeah. So that's well, a uniqueness. But as, as gar regards other habits, uh, I, I think all of us find a routine that really serves us well. I try to be consistently spiritual. I say my morning prayers. I say my nighttime prayers. I take time to read scripture at night just before I go to sleep. I think it uh, sets me up for better dreams. It's a great way to book in your day, right? That's a, and I love to wake up to that and to close out the day with that. That's, And I think you kind of lay some seeds for your subconscious when you do that right before bed. I love that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big part of what I try to do. I try to write down a quick little thing to get the stuff out and then have that good little spiritual thought or something to, to bring in, you know, to kind of flip the switch.
So there's two questions I had to follow up with that. We talked about with the residency and with the surgery schedule and, and how important sleep is and recovery for the brain. And, and you guys are learning about how the brain functions at its best. Have you seen a change in the area, and particularly of surgery and surgeons where they're and residents, historically, they would get, they'd be working on no sleep. They drive them to, you know, to death almost. Um, have you seen anything change with that, or are they still as rigorous from a schedule perspective? Yeah. It, so neurosurgery is a smaller field. There are about uh, 4,500 neurosurgeons and 200 pediatric neurosurgeons in the country. Uh, this is probably compared to 20,000 orthopedic surgeons. So the fields develop proportionate to the disease prevalence. And so when they're just a handful of you, it's not easy to have a lot of breadth. Right. And a lot of cross-coverage colleagues. Uh, some of the subspecialties of medicine have adapted very nicely. Intensive care is a good example where uh, there's a nighttime doctor in the house who will go home in the morning to be replaced by his colleague. But uh, historically, before that specialty of pediatric intensive care existed, uh, these doctors had no life. They slept when they could and stayed in the hospital at night as much as they could. It was uh, all emerged in our lifetime. So in regard to um, lifestyle, in residency training, it was common to have 100, 110 hours a week in the hospital. And when we grew up and looked back, saying, well, the younger generation just doesn't know how tough it was, in reality, <laughs> um, we, we knew that yeah. this wasn't good. Right. We knew that you could fall asleep at a critical time in the middle of a phone call. I think we all had experiences like that where um, the next day, the nurse would say, would you please review this order again with Make me? You sure. gave me in the middle of the night, and I would have no You're recollection the of the order. Wow. So we realized that um, this needed to change. I think that there is a learning, however, that I got out of this. Um, I, I remember I was every other night, all night, in the hospital in my second year of neurosurgery training. And... I would come in dreading the next 36 hours after a while because you were awake and you were up and busy. After so many months in there, I one night got paged to the emergency room at 2 in the morning and a man had fallen off of his motorcycle going 70 miles per hour, didn't have a helmet on, oh. and he had suffered only a concussion. Stunning that he would live through that. When I came in and looked at him and I was so tired, I actually got really angry at him and I swore at him. Why did you do this? And I've never forgotten that because it was totally out of my character. I've I was going to say, that that's since. completely out of character for you, for sure. But it was, to me, my evidence. I had been pushed to the limit. Yeah. And here and there... Um, we realize when we're pushed to the limit and our judgment isn't as good, but this is where we also have to depend on our colleagues. And I, I guess that alludes to another interesting point where we're at right now. So right now I'm 68. I'm uh, uh, three years post the typical retirement age. 50% uh, of the physicians in the United States are retiring at 65. 50% are not, and the country depends on that because we have a shortfall of enough physicians right now, and yet, on the other hand, uh, in your older years, you have neither the cognitive nor the physical endurance, so you have to depend not only on the feedback of your colleagues to say, uh, maybe you shouldn't be doing that six-hour surgery anymore, or maybe you should not take so much call and the like. And we're acknowledging that. We're starting to institute required cognitive testing at 65 if you choose to continue in medicine because it's a field like being an airline pilot. Yeah, People depend you got, on you. Yeah, I mean, you're life and death. You can't yeah. be off your game. So you talked about being a night owl. You talked about hitting your stride you know, in those evening times. I'm fascinated by the idea of flow state. 
and how you get into a flow state and, and your perspective about how that works neurologically. What are your thoughts on that? I can relate to this most uh, clearly in the sense that uh, in some surgical procedures that can take many hours long, the longest surgery I was ever in on was 23 hours. Oh. But um, most wow. typically some complex tumors and the like are commonly in the range of six to eight hours. That's and still, I mean, that's a marathon, man. That's It is, and I um, commonly be asked, uh, how is it that, that you don't have to take a bathroom break? And I thought that was always interesting because when you are in surgery, highly focused, you simply forget. You are just focused on surgery and you are tuned to everything in the environment about that patient. And uh, things like going to the bathroom are an afterthought. And wow. after surgery, it comes up. Um, so <laughs> that's a form of flow. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but wow. again, it's more along those lines of evoked flow. <laughs> yeah, but because you, you're so concentrated. No, that's that's, right. that's brilliant. I, really, it's a level of concentration. Talking about that subconscious, I think that's one of the few times that you're consciously awake that that subconscious is beginning to play a little bit more of an active role in your thought process and what you're doing. Oh, that's cool. Thanks. That's very neat. Here's one thing I'm really curious about for you. So what's one thing under a hundred dollars that you use on a regular basis that you could not live without? <laughs> I, I really don't know that answer. Um, I have developed some toys that I love in this vein and one of them, uh, I'm just in trials right now with patient people to get their feedback. I've developed a spinning top. So you think of tops that people spin as an old toy as a child. But to me, this is fun because it a, has a magnetic field on it and you can watch when you spin it on the computer screen. It tracks around and a certain threshold will then turn on a message which is, I'm hoping, going to be customized to the interests of that person. So if you walk into your house and walk past your kitchen counter, there if you have a top sitting, most people will walk by it, stop, pause, and spin it just to watch it. It's almost entrancing. <laughs> and in my instance, I uh, see this as a way of, call it relieve anxiety, get it, get refocused, have the fun of seeing this precess around and it's intended to be inexpensive, but it's also to be distributed. So right now I'm getting feedback from people as they spin my magnetic top and watch it show up on their computer screen. <laughs> Where in the world did you get the idea for that? <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah, I'll have to show it to you and see That's if you amazing. get entranced. That's <laughs> so cool. That's great. Okay, so a couple other things I'm curious about. Um, I'm sure you hear lots of different advice out there in the field and stuff. What's some of the worst advice that you've either heard or been given? I, I think in uh, our field we have a lot of um, acquaintances in the next generation up who are our models and we want to follow them and emulate their success. In my field, we can see a lot of broken homes, a lot of divorce, a lot of bad personal decisions. And I think uh, it's easy to flip it around and say, well, what's the good advice to avoid this? Especially in a small field, where you depend on your colleague to be like you, to share your values, your motivations for your patients and the like. I remember I, I did a lot of uh, craniofacial reconstruction surgery uh, with a plastic surgery colleague uh, in children who have malformed heads and faces and the like. And he and I were very, very busy in our young careers. He and I were both the only people in town doing what we were doing. 
and the time came for us both when we needed to bring on a new colleague. And I thought that was so strange when he hired a consultant and actually had a prospective partner come on where he was asked to please take the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Inventory. It is a test which we use in psychiatry a good deal to discern certain vulnerabilities or risk factors for mental illness. And uh, this colleague took the test and the consultant said, you know, I think you'll be a good match. And I, I uh, thought that was strange. How would I react if someone asked me to take that test? Uh, but nevertheless, I became good friends also and partners in surgery with the new colleague and reflected back on that. This new colleague came from the Air Force in a military uh, orientation where his other partner had a very different background and they were highly complementary to themselves. Hmm. In, uh, in this business where there are only a few of you, you want to pick your partners and colleagues very carefully because it determines how successful or impactful your time will be. Hmm. That's a great point. I think that's a, that applies for spouses and everything. I mean, like sure. across the board, friends, I mean, who you surround yourself with. That's, yeah, for sure. Mm. Hmm. Because you're such a fascinating guy, just in general. Who fascinates you? Who do you find really appealing or interesting? In recent years, I've um, been blessed to, uh, with my wife to develop a kind of travel group where uh, we get together every year or two to go somewhere in the world on a cruise ship and to drop in places in and out and yep. visit one-on-one. -on -one. And You guys just came back from what, New Zealand and Australia, something like that? That's right. Yeah, yeah. My travel group uh, has some really high-performing, successful people in it that intrigue me. Almost exclusively, they have gotten to where they are because they took risks and they were willing to pay a high price. I think of a very well-known uh, Christian artist that's sold art all over the world. I think of a A traditional artist, like a painter? That's right, paintings. I think of a uh, biochemist who's discovered one of the most successful drugs in the arena of pain control, very successful in his science research. Or These guys are all in your travel group. Yeah, we're all different. And yeah, we're very diverse, but all yeah. excelling in your field. How did you come across these guys? How did y'all get this put oh, together? Word of mouth and conversations, yeah. but it's the usefulness of uh, uh, across all the interests and employment people may seek in their lives, you get to realize that there are threads that draw you to each other. Why did I become a neurosurgeon? Well, in part, it's the frontier nature of it, the risk-taking nature of it, the yearning to do something where we know so little or the least about a particular organ in the body. All of these um, people are good acquaintances. And uh, I have a felt that the biggest asset in my career so far has been because I was blessed with or chose to have good friends who had high ambitions and good values. And whether it was at high school or dormitory days at college, choosing good friends can help you keep on target. Yeah. My travel group's like that. I really look forward to meeting them the next time because we get into very deep discussions. Okay, I'd love to be a fly on that wall for yeah. sure. It's that old expression like you are the average of the five people you spend the yeah. most time with <laughs> kind of thing. And, and yeah, when you're rubbing elbows with people like that it just tends to you know it tends to rub off on you and you rub off on them yeah it all just kind of well and what I noticed too that this weekend being around a lot of like-minded individuals um, and you're all in that same process that everything starts to feed off itself you get this constant feedback loop and it's it's very fulfilling and it's very 
reassuring, I think, you know, just like you feel like you're learning and you're growing with good people. Um, we were talking earlier about you've had an influential role on your kids with them all going down a similar path in the, in the neurosciences, and you've been a mentor for countless numbers of physicians. And um, Was there a mentor in your life that had an impact on you early on? I, I would like to recall a man who uh, really enabled my career. He was my family physician. When I... Uh, Growing had, up as a child? Yes. When I went away for college, I um, came back after my freshman year. He called me up and invited me to go on rounds with him at the hospital. He thought perhaps I would be interested in a career in medicine. Huh. And so uh, we went down and visited four or five patients in the hospital. And then he um, talked a little bit about their individual social needs and the... Like what their situations were? What could be treated, what couldn't, and mm -hmm. the like. Uh, and then he took me down to the basement of the hospital and took me into the medical library and pulled out a book. Uh, a book that is sort of like a venerable tome <laughs> in medicine, about three inches thick, something that would hold a door open as yeah, a doorstop. Yeah, yeah, nice um, yeah, doorstop. Uh, yeah, that book is called um, Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, and it's, uh, it's probably in its 20th edition by now, but this is back in the uh, 70s, and uh, he said... A lot of people spend a lot of time in their lives trying to figure out what they want to do or what they want to be. But here is a paragraph I would like you to read and study and think about and tell me if it doesn't click with you, if it doesn't give you answers and perhaps direct your career. And it's the very first paragraph of this book. I have kept it in my notes all these years because uh, I have found it so insightful. So I would like to read it to you. Please. No greater opportunity, responsibility, or obligation is given to an individual than that of serving as a physician. In treating the suffering, there is need for technical skill, scientific knowledge, and human understanding. The person who uses these with courage, with humility, and with wisdom will provide a unique service and will build an enduring edifice of character. The physician should ask of destiny no more than this and be content with no less. I saw that as beautiful writing, it but is. in a lot of ways it formalized a approach to life which I could really easily embrace. So scientific knowledge, that's gaining the skills and the habits of study and staying current, taking your boards, showing that you're board certified, maintaining that certification, uh, technical skill. Uh, some fields in medicine are more technically oriented than others. And neurosurgery is... Um, very technically dependent and of course human understanding so to me um, few things have encapsulated the rewards as much I mentioned courage it takes courage to undertake some surgical procedures that are new or on the edge or on the frontier it takes humility I have very little patience with my colleagues who may seem uh, haughty or full of themselves. It's as if they didn't learn the lesson. You cannot be in neurosurgery and see death and see the kinds of diseases where we don't yet have effective treatments and not be humbled. We have to be remembering when there's the so time. much still to learn. That's right. Mm -hmm. And as to asking no more of our destiny than this, and it's being content with no less. Um, whatever a person's 
choice in life is if it can be formulated that they can see they've matched up their interests, their aptitudes, and their yearnings. They will be happy people. That's very cool. And that doctor, bless you. And you, he, that was just out of the blue? He just, <laughs> he just had his eye on you, huh? Yes. Uh, he opened the door for me um, yeah. as I went through undergraduate years. A time well, came to apply to medical school. He was one of the first board certified in the new field of family medicine. He was very good friends with one of the members of the admissions committee at the University of Washington. He called that man personally saying, I want to signal to you Kim's application. Wow. Uh, what an incredible blessing. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, any other uh, childhood memories that had a lasting impact on you? That was in Washington where that when you were going? So I grew up in Idaho Falls. Idaho Falls. Uh, this is a town of about 30,000 in sure, southeast Idaho. Um, it's a lot bigger now than it used to be it <laughs> back is. when you were there. <laughs> you probably right. hardly recognize it now. Idaho Falls was unique um, because the National Atomic Energy Commission during the Cold War, the 50s, set up uh, nuclear research 50, 60 miles to the west of Idaho Falls. Hmm. And in this area, we called it the site, the first uh, peaceful use of atomic energy. The first town that was lighted by atomic energy was Arco, Idaho, just to the west of where I grew up. Huh. And uh, the first atomic um, nuclear powered submarine power plant was made in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And my student colleagues, my friends, going all the way through high school were the children of all these scientists who came in from all over the United States. So Idaho Falls being an agricultural town historically yeah. had this wonderful mix with science. I, uh, about six months ago, went to my 50th high school reunion. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I had the enjoyment of seeing uh, career choices and reminiscing, but I reflected often on how fortunate that was to grow up in a town like that. It right. was somewhat insulated. I didn't have any friends who, uh, whose parents I knew of were dealing with alcoholism or drug difficulties. I didn't have any friends who were dealing with divorce. It was a very insulated environment to grow up. And these days, uh, being in pediatric neurosurgery and seeing the challenges. It doesn't exist anymore. That's right. Now yeah. our focus is on trying to help children have resilience uh, because they cope with a lot of difficulties. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of challenges, yeah. I reflect back on that often, how blessed I was to get to have the environment that I grew up in and, and the opportunities, you know, growing up. Yeah. Tell me about your first big win. Your first big success. Actually, my uh, first invention product has also been my most successful. Uh, it's called a micro needle. It's a little, a very, very sharp tip made out of tungsten. And it's used and sold very widely throughout the world. 41 countries routinely sell it in large volume or use it in surgery. And it started out because I was in surgery, reflecting back on that book, Magnificent Obsession, and um, thinking to myself, if we could only make less heat and make more precision, we could do some things with less risk for nerve injury, faster recovery, and the like. I had met a man who was a professor of metallurgy at Denver University. And he had become a bit of a mentor to me as we explored our common interests. He had developed uh, much of the technology that we used in shunts, treating hydrocephalus in children. But I knew he was a metallurgist. Okay, so he was a metallurgist, but because obviously you don't normally think of that in a tradition like in a medical That's type correct. arena. But okay, so that was the, the link was within dealing with the stents and stuff. That's right. Okay. Now, now it makes a little more sense to me. I'm sitting there going, how in the world did you two link up? But so we, we had a conventional tool at that time, which uh, was somewhat comparatively coarse. 
and I thought to myself, if we could only make this tip ultra sharp. So I called him up and talked with him on the phone and he said, well, tungsten theoretically can actually be drawn to one molecule or atom at its tip. And it is therefore the uh, emitter in cathode ray tubes for electrons. It could be drawn that tiny. Wow. And I know how to do that. <laughs> so I went over and visited with Jack and uh, Jack developed a, a mix of nitric acid and sharpened some very tiny tungsten tips right to the point where you couldn't even see the tip. And uh, back in those days... That's like that line to infinity kind of thing. That's right. <laughs> back in those days, in the hospital environment, all I had to do was assure that it was sterile and assure that I was taking appropriate precautions on behalf of a patient's well-being, and I could trial something. And I no took kidding. it in the operating room, and uh, um, it was impressive. I could drop the power needed to dissect to about 10% of what was wow. used normally. Most people don't realize, but surgery is done generally with what's called electrosurgery, where we actually pass a current through the body, but it seals or sears tissue so that we don't get out of control. With, but it's that heat that's also problematic. So this was the goal, and uh, that device was so successful it was broadly adopted in plastic surgery and ENT I say not surgery just for the neurosurgery, that's got applications surgery. across the board. Yeah. Wow. I've, I've had the pleasure of being in many countries in the world where I've gone into the operating room and seen them using products that I developed out of my garage. <laughs> and people don't realize how many things come out of garages in the biomedical world. A lot do. I know a lot of those inventors. Uh, where that's where you work after hours trying to figure out or solve a problem. Yeah. But to me, that's a huge compliment to see someone else say, oh, yeah. this helps me, this makes me do my surgery better. That's a little boost to the ego, too. It's like it, it you know, is. got something that's like, that's right. when you see something that's got, like, kind of like your name on it sort of thing. Yeah. That's really cool. That's very neat. Hmm. So do you want to talk about any of the other products? Like, I mean, obviously we don't have time to go down the path of each one, but tell us a little bit more about some of these other products that you developed. We've talked about the chair. Mm -hmm. the, well, I call it the chair. I'm probably doing it a disservice by calling it that. And then this micron needles. What are some of the other products that you have developed over these years? One of the fun ones. Um, so when a person falls off their motorcycle um, and they'll have a helmet on, uh, the brain swells, just like if I slugged you in the arm, it would swell. And this is one of our challenges in neurosurgery, is the brain is the only organ that's in a box. So when it swells, it can only swell so far, and then the pressure inside the head goes up high, so you can't get enough blood flow to the brain. A spiral downward starts in the irreversibility of recovery. And uh, to guide us in the management of patients who are in the ICU, we commonly do a quite simple procedure, which is to place into the brain a little pressure sensor. And that measures the pressure in real time uh, so that we can give drugs or it can guide when to go to surgery. And of course, it can signal when surgery is, you know, are hopeless. So one of these uh, products is now the most widely used intracranial pressure sensor in the world. And its genesis was that a friend of mine, an engineer, said, I read about this interesting project that NASA has been investigating, a pressure sensor made out of a small strain gauge. You ought to look at that. So he got me started looking in this trade journal called Sensors, which became a huge resource for me. Three more products came out of just translating out of that magazine into just medicine. Digging in, yeah. <laughs> but this uh, um, man in Houston, Texas, Huntley Millar was his name, uh, had developed a pressure sensor for monkeys who would be going into space to monitor cardiac pressures. So okay. the instrumented monkey could guide and anticipate what happens when we put a human into space Yeah, you'll know which points are going to be under stress and whatever, yeah. And I called him up on the phone and said, uh, are these sterile? Can these potentially have an application in medicine? 
And he said, sure, I'll send you a couple of sterile ones. And the first one was uh, a five French tube. So uh, you can imagine that's somewhere between a sixteenth of an eighth inch in diameter. Okay. Small enough that I could use it. And uh, I was in my second year of residency when I figured this out. And I had a woman who was, uh, w had just delivered a child with a complex problem inside the head called a vein of Galen aneurysm. It's a large dilation of a vessel right in the center of the brain where an artery should go to a capillary bed but goes directly to a vein so it gets very large and it's high risk for bleeding and injury to the brain. Well, um, I took this sensor and took this newborn baby to the operating room and through the back of the head through a small incision, I guided that up through a vessel into the big dilated vessel and hooked it up to devices that had been developed for the meteorology world. So back then, in the agriculture and meteorology world, we were at 96 uh, KBOD. So that's the speed of uh, transmissions on these old original modems. And we could get weather data from a remote sensor on a mountain through phone links and the like at 9600 okay. KBOD. So I put this into the baby's head and hooked it up to the modem in the neonatal ICU. First time I think that anyone had done that. And I could at home monitor the pressure inside the baby's brain where this wow. arterial blood flow was mixing. And then I invited out a colleague from Florida to Phoenix to, who had developed this technique of teaching, treating these very difficult mass malformations of blood vessels where we put little emboli into it. And every time uh, I took the child to surgery, when he taught me, he came the first time. Uh, I was remotely monitoring the pressure step down See, yeah. for uh, several sessions. It was about five surgeries to get this to its end point. And uh, it was fascinating because it preceded, it was a forerunner of remote monitoring of patients in the ICU. Things we do routinely like, now. Yeah, commonplace now, right? Like yeah. it's just normal. Right? But this was 1988. Wow. And there I could tell, sitting in my study at my home, exactly when the nurse came up and bothered the baby. The baby would wake <laughs> up, the pressures would go up. She would touch the fontanelle on the top of the head. I could tell the pressures. And I would like, call, I'd call her up and say, what are you doing? And she said, we almost got paranoid because you could watch us. But it, it became the evidence that this That's would work. Brilliant. So that pressure sensor was then adopted into the brain for head trauma, into the covering spaces over the brain for uh, hydrocephalus yeah, monitoring. Yeah, because so many applications. And uh, uh, a friend of mine who was the vice president of... Um, research and development for the Johnson Johnson's Neurosurgery Division. He was a frequent visitor to my home. <laughs> well, and, uh, I would be too if that was my job. <laughs> I'd be your yeah. best friend. <laughs> yeah, they gave me a grant and a, a little bit of a slush fund. And wow, every, every cool. uh, year I gave them my ideas and that was the beginning of a That's really how it all kind of started. Nice. Pathway, yeah. Huh. It's neat to hear somebody of your stature and caliber doing these little tinkering in the garage kind of things because I have other buddies and we're in the industry of like the shoe industry, like my buddy Brian who, who did the ultra shoes and, and I've got another friend Tom who was in the, in the inline skate arena. Mm. And, and both of them, that's exactly how they had success and exactly how they did all their product development. It was like in a shed in the backyard or in yes. their garage and their thing. Now, granted, they don't have these state-of-the-art laboratories going on, but, but it's the, at the end of the day, it's the, the same kind of process. It's the tinkering and getting into the flow state and, and being really good at in within your industry and and realizing the need for bigger better products you know that because that's really what drove them and it's what dro the same thing that what drove you it's that i want to have something better for me for what it is i'm trying to do nobody's got it out there well if they're not going to make it then i will you know we'll come up with something that works and that's that's such a I'm, I feel so fortunate to be around people like you and those guys that have that because that's a really rare thing, I feel like. Creators and artists, you know, you see that with them and with you guys, but you don't see that um, very often. 
Well, I, I think the very point that we're talking uh, w and cross-exchanging ideas, observations, it leads to the next step. I, I think that uh, one thing that I've learned in my laboratory, if you could come into my garage lab, you'd see seven projects all on their own tables, and I go from table to table. What I've realized is that it's a mistake to have one thing in your life that is your purpose to solve because it doesn't work that way, you get stuck. And if you just leave it alone for a few months and go to the next table and work on that project and then the next table, all of a sudden in the back of your mind you will realize you have solved it or you've got a new idea to try and you go back and put, pick it up. So this idea that uh, we need to work on one thing in our lives is wrong. Uh, everything moving along as a group complements each other and forms it. That, that's been exactly the case for me personally going through this journey with the podcast and the website and, and the book and all the different things that I'm trying to do. And there's a, about a, two or three different businesses that go along with that. And I found the exact same thing to be the case. It's like you just, I'll take this one to as far as I can go and I kind of hit that wall or that dead end or, you know, that that struggle point, then okay, we'll drop that, go to the next one, take that one as far as I can, and then by the time I get back around to that other one, or as I'm letting it sit there, that opportunity presents itself somewhere else that allows me to come back to it and then apply something completely different, apply that to what that problem is I'm facing or that obstacle that I'm trying to overcome. It yeah. seems to be, I, I think that's the only way. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. I, I agree. If you were listening to this podcast or if you had a podcast, who would you like to interview? Who would you like to hear from? I love to hear the stories of people who are discoverers. To me, discoverers are the heroes of our world. I remember um, some years ago, the Boeing Aircraft Corporation had a slogan uh, which they used in their advertising, Forever Frontiers. And uh, that hit me as, that's what I want my slogan to be. I always want to be doing something new. I don't want to ever settle down into a uh, rut. And I think that this is an attitude toward life too, especially to the aging population who contemplates retirement. Um, in that regard, let me, let me make a comment. Uh, I alluded before to the point that I'm 68 now and many of my colleagues are retiring and I've chosen not to. I'm trying to repurpose, redirect, so to say. But I want to remember a very uh, delicate experience for me. When I was, so this is about 14, 15 years ago, my uh, middle son, the son who was just finishing his first year of medical school and he was now a neurosurgeon about four years into practice. So he had come for Christmas break to our home and uh, I had spent the day inviting him into the operating room and he had watched me do some surgeries and watched me on rounds. And it was late at night about uh, 9 p.m. and we were on our way home and I just got paged to the county hospital to come see a girl. Um, so I stopped there and we went into the ICU and we learned that that 16-year-old uh, girl had been hit a few hours before by a drunk driver. And my assessment of the girl was in fact at this point to uh, do what we call clinical brain death determination. Her body had not been badly injured, but her brain had been rendered what we call brain dead. And I took the moment to take my son through uh, the neurologic examination in coma and in brain death determination where we look at how the pupils don't react or the eyes won't move and how the gag reflex goes away and how no one can breathe again because that part of the brain has passed away. And when we finished the exam and I visited with the mom indicating there was no hope, nothing further to offer, 
It was a very solemn, sad time because it was the Christmas season. She had been out Christmas shopping when this happened. And uh, we drove home in the dark night in the car, um, not talking at all, just thinking about what we had just experienced. And I got home that night, and uh, there was a Christmas card that had been sent me from one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, she's a bit of a poet, an infectious disease doctor, and it really impressed me, and I've kept it with me all these years, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, it's called a, a Doctor's Christmas Lament. They need me here, they page me there, too much to do, it isn't fair, too many patients to admit, no time to sleep or eat a bit. Oh, what a way to spend my Christmas day. I know I'm doing what I should, but what's the use of being good? Instead of food and gifts and fun, I'm being paged by everyone. Oh, what a way to spend my Christmas day. Perhaps I should reflect anew. If Christ were here, what would he do? He'd heal the sick, attend the lame, and teach me how to do the same. What better way to spend a Christmas day? When I read that, um, I, I really realized, in a lot of ways, we're never really meant to retire. We choose to engage with our Heavenly Father's children with the talents or skills or time we're given on the earth. And if we choose to be available is what makes the difference. And in some ways, that's informed this time in my life. Uh, when I say forever frontiers, I hope to stay active and productive for many years to come. But the point that, what would he do? <laughs> he would likely be in service trying to lift others. So in this regard, it has been an incredible blessing in my life to have found neurosurgery. A blessing in my life to have... Um, found a wife who would support me in this and the rewards are to see people go on and pick up and redirect and compensate after bad things have happened but to like I mentioned before to have been able to be the person there when they needed somebody to be able to be counted on and relied on um, and I think that's what's so great about the gospel and for our church is that a lot of what we do is to be prepared, you know, to be prepared to be called on to give a blessing, to be prepared to call on to be on call. And if you're out drinking, partying and doing, living a different kind of a lifestyle, you can't be prepared. Right. You can't have that level of preparation ready to go when people need you. Yeah. That's a pretty rewarding feeling. That's right. For sure. <laughs> I, I normally like wrap this up on like all these lighthearted notes, but I feel like I just need to close it down. I mean, you're like you're bringing us to such a, whew. oh man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. So, what's the story you want to be remembered for? Well, I, I want to um, be remembered as being someone who was kind. Um, I see so many things we don't have good answers for. And the choice to be there, but to listen and support. This, uh, this, this last weekend, uh, I took care of a three-year-old child who was sent out by the wonderful foundation called the Make-A-Wish Foundation from oh, Seattle. Nice. Yeah. She has a terminal brain tumor. And the family was enjoying their time here only to be interrupted by a severe grand mal seizure. And the child came to the emergency room uh, now with what we call fixed dilated pupils, no longer able to see. And I had to do an emergency bedside procedure and then to take this child to surgery a couple of days later and to get her ready to get back transported on the plane back to Seattle for what will be just a few months left to live. 
And as I listened to the parents, and I called up and talked with the medical team in Seattle, I felt so much the privilege to be able to care for that child. But also, it was a really good feeling to send them out the door last night, knowing that they're going to be back home with their loved ones as this child passes away and to be reinvigorated, re-engaged. Many of us at the end of our career say, well, what's the big thing that we're really thinking about all the time that has to be tackled, and, and so often it's cancer. And the, all the ingenious approaches and biochemistry and devices to try to approach that, it's a really tough, insidious disease. And I go home back to my lab saying I've been working on this idea I'm going to get right in and keep going because somewhere someday someone's going to find a switch a defining way to control this and who knows maybe I can contribute talk about purpose yeah <laughs> thank you for your time really glad I got this opportunity. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening. So what'd you think? What did I miss? Anything that you wanted to hear that I didn't cover? What do you want to know more about? Who would you like to see on the show? Hit us up on social media and tell me what you think. Check us out on iTunes and please leave a review. We're now on Patreon and your support there helps let us know we're headed in the right direction. We have a lot of exciting new things coming. Fascinating guests and some of the craziest stories you won't believe. So stay in the loop and check out more great content by subscribing at our website, 8keystogreat.com. Special thanks to my guests, and all those of you living an extraordinary life. This is Nate G. We'll see you next week.